Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's see. Great. Loading up. Uh, so in terms of scale, uh, I'll start with a familiar chart, something I think we're perhaps numb to, seeing this, this kind of uh, accelerating trajectory. Looking at the last 100 plus years of uh, energy consumption, and there are similar trajectories that we can find uh, for uh, global material extraction, and another accelerating trajectory over that time period being population growth. These are all normalized to uh, the most recent figures of 2010 from zero to 100% in that time period. So growth is exciting in many ways. Uh, it has costs, it has limits, obviously. If we look at the ecological footprint uh, in the last, or since 61 to 2011, it, it would appear to be somewhat flat. Of course, this is uh, land area per capita, a footprint equivalent, uh, but with a, with a dramatically increasing population during that time period, of course, the biocapacity is dropping uh, pretty significantly, and we're familiar with, uh, with this overshoot that happened uh, somewhere in this time period, as well as the this other interesting uh, fact or, or measurement, let's say, has to do with the amount of remaining wilderness, what, what's considered wild lands, uh, wilderness in the world, which is now at about a quarter of its original uh, land area. Moving to the proportions of uh, resource consumption, I think uh, we can see pretty clearly the type of shift that happened with industrialization. And so normally we're used to seeing these parabolic uh, types of trajectories related to quantity. Here we're looking at proportion, obviously. And uh, we can see two very unequal phases of resource consumption between renewable uh, sources versus non-renewable. Obviously renewable, this, this phase goes back for millennia where we were primarily using wood as a fuel source. What's interesting is in the development, rapid development as you can see, and shift towards non-renewable resources that we began to diversify. Uh, so coal was clearly the, what we might call the disruptive technology, uh, energy-wise compared with wood. But quickly, uh, our hunger uh, continued to uh, be unsatisfied, let's say, and look at other sources of energy, primarily fossil fuel based. And we see, we see some diversification also happening in materials. So this is a more recent look, the last few decades of uh, materials. I think it's worth noting, though, that uh, where in mid-century we were we were sort of metal dominant and very interested in alloy uh, technology, a uh, little bit in polymers and, and ceramics, et cetera, that now we can see with more and more advanced materials, kind of evening of the playing field, more diversification, if you will, of uh, resource development. Now looking forward, this, this is where things get pretty interesting. This is a projection, obviously. Uh, but there are a couple things to note here. One is that this diversification is only predicted to increase. And so just remember, we were primarily a wood-based uh, society, if you will, uh, for millennia. Shifted to fossil fuels, but now we have, uh, we're sort of looking everywhere and anywhere for the resources for the next for the future, foreseeable future. And many of these are now <clears throat> renewable. So a couple of shifts here, intensified diversification of sources, but also a shift back towards renewable energy, not necessarily just wood now, right? And so this, this leads me to pose the question, are, are we in the midst of a third phase uh, based on these two um, phenomena? 
And we, we see something similar happening with materials as well. And that can lead to some interesting results. As Tom Gradle has pointed out, as we mine the periodic table, uh, we, we can find ourselves in some interesting predicaments with uh, critical elements, geopolitically insecure elements, for example. Do we really need to use and, and find uh, applications for every single element, uh, rare earth elements, et cetera? This is a, a question that's not typically associated with the notion of embodied energy is, is something like geopolitical insecurity, uh, but perhaps should be. And just thinking in terms of scale uh, of embodiment also, uh, David mentioned this uh, earlier, is that the average building over 50 years, uh, we, we have to think about the, the amount of energy that goes into all of the adaptations and, and changes, which is roughly three times the cost of the original building. So from, from one point of view, and I'm reiterating what David had said, the whole notion of embodied energy being defined as cradle to project opening day, let's say, for, for architecture, uh, is, is severely limited when we think about uh, life cycle and process. And as Stuart Brand has reminded us, thinking of the various layers uh, that are constantly in flux in buildings, that a building is always tearing itself apart. So what does this mean for architecture? Uh, I'll share some uh, examples of projects that, that I find to have uh, some interesting approaches related to these various issues of, uh, uh, of an architecture which is looking to looking at more diverse resources, looking at process more than final product. So here's some questions. Uh, could architecture begin to engage not just embodiment, disembodiment, but questions of re-embodiment? This is already happening uh, in projects like this, which is celebrating to some extent the reuse of salvage building materials in new ways or adaptive reuse. When I was a young student in architecture in the early days, greenfield sites, uh, in my experience, were kind of the normal beginning to a project uh, brief. But I think increasingly we see, based on the realities, that adaptive reuse will actually become the norm. These were some uh, brutalist uh, towers that were reclad in polycarbonate panels that slide that we won't just reuse or repurpose existing building materials, but remake them. A company like Stone Cycling that uh, reconstitutes new uh, forms of masonry out of pulverized, uh, demolished building materials. That uh, technology like 3D printing won't just produce prefabricated things, but fabricated things on site, that we now are, are getting to the scale uh, of, of technology where we can actually print on-site using on-site materials. Something like uh, going off-grid is, is quite well known now, uh, but it's interesting to follow the projects that showcase this technology, uh, especially with dramatic lighting effects, uh, but looking, looking more uh, deeply at off-grid capacity. And uh, internal cradle-to-cradle -cradle operations, such as this microbial home project looking at waste-to-food processes uh, within buildings. And thinking about ecosystem services more deeply, uh, I find this project uh, especially intriguing because of the way in which it uses architecture as a platform for ecosystem services. Uh, to the extent we can, we can consider vertical algae farming to be a kind of ecosystem service, uh, generating biomass that's then harvested and that energy is used to fuel uh, or power the building. Or the extent to which we can think of architecture as an ecosystem. I was just talking to one of our landscape architecture uh, faculty members at Minnesota about 
the different viewpoints that we have for our projects. Uh, talked about how uh, for landscape architect, your view is typically 50 years out. That opening day on a project isn't nearly as meaningful as, as uh, the day a few decades later once everything matures uh, and the constant process that, that's entailed in cultivating that landscape. Whereas in architecture, we have the unfortunate adage uh, that maybe not everyone believes, but some believe that the building will never look as good as the day it was photographed. Um, I think there's some reconciliation that can happen between these two views of our work. And uh, not that all of our buildings will be grown from living trees like this project, uh, but I think a more process-based uh, uh, perspective is required in architecture today. So if the second material epoch is, we could say, uh, defined by all these perspectives, right? We had unlimited resources. Uh, we're not really thinking about anthropogenic effects and things are centralized, buildings are products. We really focus on first life, energy uniformity, greenfield sites, virgin material resources, et cetera. I think it's worth asking the question if our new paradigm is shaped by these things. What, is that, what does that suggest for architecture today and in the future? Uh, because in, in the classroom today, in the office today, uh, a lot of the conversations contain these types of points of view, right? Uh, that we have limited resources, that our fingerprint on this planet is, is measurable, uh, we're, we're moving towards more of a distributed process-based model where we focus on life cycle and uh, the, the, uh, the imperative to be even more inventive has to do with the way that we can look at diver diverse sources, use them adaptively and repurpose them creatively. So thank you very much. I look forward to hearing the rest of the sessions. Uh, so what I want to share with you today is uh, my views on biology and particularly uh, my interest in how you can use biology to create better products and better processes. And uh, today I'm going to be telling you a little about the work we do at Ecovative, which is using a living organism essentially to grow polymers. Um, and one of the reasons I'm interested in biology is because it allows you to add a, a serious amount of complexity to a material uh, with relatively little energetic uh, cost. Uh, and I think that's important because the more complexity you can add to materials, the more functions you can get them to do, uh, and the more efficient they can be. Uh, I wanted to start by sharing a picture of my tractor with you today. Uh, this is a Fordson Major, and uh, the reason I want to share this is because uh, it has a heat engine in it. Uh, and if you look at heat engines uh, over time, they really demonstrate uh, how adding complexity to materials can increase efficiency. So you start in the 1850 with uh, a steam engine, you move through railroad engines, you move into the Fordson Power Major, right? But if you look at a biological system like this cheetah, you'll find out you actually have a higher power to weight ratio than any of those engines I showed you over the last 150 years of heat engine development. And that's because bio biology inherently produces complexity. This cheetah was self-assembled molecule by molecule by the cells in its body. And a cheetah actually has a power to weight ratio about double of a Ford Focus. Now, it's likely as we continue to improve on heat engine technology, we're at the end of the S curve, we'll probably get to cheetah level technology. But you still have a system that's pretty elegant, right, in terms of its embodied energy. Uh, it bootstrapped itself uh, by eating smaller animals. Uh, at the end of its life cycle, it's completely recyclable. It actually becomes nutrients for the environment it's based on. And it has all these incredible emergent properties because of the way it's built molecule by molecule. So I'm really interested in not how do we copy biology in architecture, which is often, uh, in design, is often referred to as myomimicry. Uh, I'm very interested in how do you actually apply biology directly to our existing products and processes to produce better things. And I think it's one of the key enabling technologies, along with actually uh, synthetic biology and GMOs. I'm, I run an environmentally oriented company, but I, I'm pro-GMO, uh, that's going to allow us to sustain humanity on our planet for the coming centuries. Uh, and so I'm going to get a little technical here and show you uh, yeast cells because uh, the way we use yeast in biology today is actually pretty bad. 
So the cheetah is beautiful, right? The cheetah has a function, right? The way we use yeast today ignores the entire complexity of the cell. We essentially feed the yeast sugar. We collect ethanol, right? Anyone ever brew beer at home? Anyone, anyone do that? Okay, a tame audience, I guess. I got one. All right, cool. <laughs> um, right, but that you do that, you throw away the yeast, right? You throw away this beautiful cellular factory, right, that, that assembled this complex molecule, and you collect the ethanol. We do this when we, when we turn corn into ethanol today as well for fuel, which is just totally crazy. It's like, that's the yeast droppings. It's like falling around the cheetah, picking up the cheetah droppings, and saying, I'm really op optimizing the use of this cheetah. Instead, you should ask, how can we turn this whole yeast cell into a material? How do we use the complexity of this living factory, all this efficiency, all this information that biology presents us to create better products? So at Ecovative, we use a kind of filamentous yeast, uh, growing mycelium. And the observation of the insight we've had at Ecovative is that this growing yeast, which in nature essentially grows, it, it breaks down leaf matter, it breaks down wood matter, uh, right? Uh, and kind of recycles things in nature, but it also forms this tenacious polymer net network. So we said, well, what if instead of trying to extract the polymer from mycelium, we just grew objects directly with mycelium? And that insight has turned into saying, well, mycelium is really a resin. It's like a programmable polymer. So in our process, uh, we essentially combine mycelium, which is this programmable polymer, you can think of it as a yeast, with a scaffolding material, um, which isn't sugar. You know, we target things like low-value lignocellulosic waste streams, that's like corn stover or wheat straw or, or wood fiber. Uh, and we mix them together. It's a little like baking bread, right? We put them into a mold, and then the complexity of the organism starts figuring out what enzymes it needs to make, right? Okay, I'm sitting next to a piece of wood fiber. That means I need to break, make enzymes to break down the cellulose. Then I'm going to eat the cellulose, and I'm going to build another segment of my cell wall. And as it does this, it builds this polymer network. So you can visualize this. This is a time lapse of an actual part growing uh, in our factory. And you can see this is about four days accelerated, how the material is actually transformed. And the whole complex becomes the final product. In this case, it's a piece of packaging, replacing some styrofoam packaging. So instead of extracting something from the corn stover, right, extracting something from the mycelium and then maybe using uh, an extruder to put it back together, the whole complex is being transformed. And this is what biology does really well. And by leveraging this both for disposable applications like packaging uh, and in the built environment, you can make materials with drastically better properties for the humans around them, like lower emissions, lower toxicity, and drastically better economic efficiencies, which means they scale in our capitalist system. Um, we've created essentially three generations of this material now. We've been working to commercialize them. Uh, the first is this base composite you saw growing. It's essentially a low-density material. Uh, we've used it for structural projects. It's home compostable. It's sort, of, uh, it's sort of meant to be a replacement for styrofoam, and we're using it in that application. The second thing we're working on is a myco board, which uses these same emergent properties where we grow a resin uh, through a fibrous material. Um, but instead of um, give, letting that be its final form, letting it be self-supporting, we actually compress it under heat and pressure and take advantage of the chemistry. So we're not anti-chemistry. You have sugars and other things that have been synthesized. If you press this under heat and pressure, you get cross-linking. This allows you to substitute for some of the nasties that are used in industry like urea formaldehyde. If you look at the cellular structure of mycelium, which is similar to a yeast cell, you basically have chitin and beta-gluten, glucans, which flow under heat and pressure. Um, so we've also used this to create beautiful objects. Uh, and this is where I think design is really important to help pull some of these technologies into application. So we helped create the Gunlock Saver chair about two years ago. We grew the chair back. This was the first demonstration, and it was one of the top 10 uh, green building products. There's no formaldehyde emissions, it's got a low carbon footprint, it's got low embodied energy, it's grown to shape, and then it's set using the same presses that are in industry. Um, we've also grown and tested SIP panels. Uh, I think SIP panels are a really beautiful form of construction, uh, even when they have styrofoam in them. Uh, and when we grow a SIP panel, we're actually able to uh, glue ourselves to the SIPs through growth. Uh, but what a lot of the stuff we do today is constrained by how we think about buildings, how we think about packaging today, how we think about material goods. So we have to create products that uh, ultimately can be sold through the same distribution channels. And uh, some of the things I'm most excited about, though, are how do you use these 
biological processes uh, to change the way we do things. Uh, so one of my favorite projects I wanted to share here is that uh, we actually grew a building at Ecovative. And I actually, I, I live off grid at home and I also grew a building and it works quite well. Um, this is something you really can't do because of building codes. You know, code, code is very prescriptive, so you're, you're really funneled into certain ways of building, right? When we sell our insulation, we dry it and we kill it and we get it ASTM tested to prove that it's dead. But really, our insulation works better if it's sort of dehydrated and semi-alive. That way, if it gets wet, it doesn't mold, it reanimates and fights off the competitor, right? That's a better process, but that's way outside the scope of how architects, designers, and especially the building inspector expects materials to behave. To make this uh, grown building, though, we essentially took a structure, this pine boards on the outside, instead of putting studs down the walls, we just filled it up with our growing material. Um, and you can work with this material, it looks sort of like wet sawdust, but it's inoculated with cells. Uh, and you can fill it in these cavities, and it actually glued the whole building together. Uh, we put this on a trailer, uh, mostly for the building code reasons I mentioned. Uh, so it's a car, not a house. I'm sure you're familiar with the tiny house technology and how it relates to building code. Uh, and we've taken it all over the place. We've subjected it to 80 mile winds by pulling it down the interstate to New York City. Um, and this was a big experiment, but it's worked out great. Uh, it's been outside of Ecovative for three years now. It's a popular conference space in the summer and winter. Um, and these are the kind of innovations I'm really excited about. Uh, just so you know, I do eat my own dog food. Um, so this is our, my solar shed. Uh, and I did actually insulate it uh, using our own material. Uh, and that's worked out pretty well, uh, though I did use scraps from the office, so they weren't all consistent. Um, and I also, I couldn't, I couldn't come and present today without talking about some of the really cool projects uh, other folks have done. David made this amazing structure, which is probably the largest microstructure, it is the largest microstructure ever created, uh, 40 feet tall, and used about 10,000 micro bricks. Uh, and this is... Uh, was such an amazing embodiment of what's possible using these sorts of materials. And it was, it was really cool and way, way more ambitious than anything we ever would have undertaken uh, ourselves. Um, and I want to end with just sharing how this relates to industrial scale. Uh, because all this stuff is kind of cool, right? Sounds cool, uh, looks cool, but if people don't use these products and processes, it's, it, it, it won't have impact. And so the other half of what we do at Ecovative is how do you insert biology into existing industrial processes such that you can actually upgrade capital assets that are already present. Because if, if you go out and say, okay, we want to replace all the particle board plants in the United States with a, a healthier, greener particle board, you're, it's not going to happen. They've been there for 50 years. The capital assets are fully depreciated. No one's buying new capital. So we're working at scale on making particle board by going into plants like this that basically combine wood fiber with urea formaldehyde and really nasty glue, gives off bad emissions, um, and we're saying, look, we'll insert biology into the front of your plant. Well, instead of putting glue on your wood chips, you'll put mycelium on your wood chips. Let it grow through your wood chips, and you can use the same plant and equipment. And these are the sorts of angles you have to take, I think, to really move the needle in terms of how we, we make and produce things. So, you know, our vision <laughs> is mycelium and some of these old captive assets. Uh, and then I just, I, I, I couldn't resist. Uh, it's Earth Day. Um, it's, it's the morning. I wanted to put up some pictures of some cute kids. Uh, these are one of our scientist children, Damon, uh, is actually, and, and just mentioned that if you're interested in this, uh, we actually provide uh, what's called a grow-it-yourself version of this. Uh, we're really interested in seeing what other people create uh, using this platform. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's Earth Day. Uh, if you could think of a, a cool thing to make, uh, I highly recommend you get some of this material and come up with a cool product. So grow it yourself. That's all I got. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm, I'm happy to start because I've appreciated uh, your work for for some time now. And when I've when I've introduced uh, Ecovative uh, products in to students and other audiences in the past, and, and especially architects, uh, uh, and, and particularly when this was quite new, yeah. uh, I used to ask architects or or students uh, bound to be uh, architects in practice, what they would think about putting uh, a fungus in their wall cavity, uh, which I know it's not quite, quite that, but the, whole, but the whole notion of growing something uh, rather than kind of typical industrial process has always intrigued me. And I'm, I'm especially intrigued now 
buy your grow grow your own building mm -hmm. uh, project because it I also wondered uh, I mean we had this really interesting uh, heritage of sod building construction for example primarily in the in the Midwest and I was fascinated to when I first learned about how sod buildings uh, work how they actually become stronger over time because you still have uh, the root system uh, of the of the grass that's still kind of growing yeah. through one sod module to the next and so I'm wondering if if in addition to uh, kind of resilient or regenerative capacity of of modules that are still alive yeah. if there's if there are other capacities too maybe it's not just I mean I think that's fascinating right if the modules are uh, somewhat self regenerative but yeah. maybe maybe over time they actually change yeah I think that's I think that's the ultimate brand promise of biology is yeah. is the ability to have uh, living functions uh, embedded <laughs> in the products and um, I would say for us personally, we're, we're not there today, but that my dream would be to have a building with not, not just mycelium insulation, but other bio components that, that change and adapt. And I do think a component to that is gaining control over biological systems. Mm -hmm. Everything I showed today was done with a native type organism, which, which is cool, right? It's, it's non-GMO, but if we had even more control over that organism, you could have your building synthesizing the, the compounds it needs for uh, what kind of facade you have that day, you know? Right. Different facades for the summer and the winter, right? These are the things that, that living organisms do that are, that are so incredible and make them so versatile. And so we're sort of on this curve of um, substitution through biocomplexity when it's dead. But I'm most interested, I think the most potential for all biological innovations will come. Like, how do you keep it alive? How do you make biological organisms into products or buildings, right? Mm -hmm. what, I'm, I'm curious too, uh, if you could talk about some of your uh, run-ins with building code officials or, or you know some some of the or maybe working with uh, traditional industries yeah I, there's been it's getting better I would say yeah. uh, definitely when we started with an insulation product and when we went and said we want to put fungus in your walls that was that was not a good pitch <laughs> uh, so, so we evolved that and the the truth is you go through all your compliance testing and your code testing and um, you just have to figure out what that is and you meet spec and then people get, get comfortable. And, mm -hmm. and that's totally rational. I mean, you're building things, most people are building them to last a long time, um, or they hope. Uh, but it does mean you lose, you know, if say, if we're gonna kill this product at the end of its life, because that way we know we'll have code compliance. If you go through the ASTM mold test where you put something in 100% humidity, uh, you know, it, it shouldn't grow mold, right? Now, if your anti-mold strategy is to have the organism overgrow any mold that was in the chamber and seal it up, that's a fail. Yeah, so that's that's kind of where you get. I think code can be very restrictive, um, and then you know, personally, I've, living off grid code's been very challenging because there's all sorts of regulations around how big your house should be. You know, and mm. so I I would prefer to. I think that how, finding creative ways around those rules are important for innovations. And actually, just in general, I like the tiny house movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. So I'm curious about how the, um, since now the material is alive. Oh, sure. So, um, fantastic presentations, both of you, thanks. Um, the, I think maybe in the context of understanding these broad energy issues, right, at this huge national scale, but then thinking of the context of shifting from non-living sort of uh, banal base materials to things that then have life cycles that actually embody the word life, right? What does it mean when your material dies, like this thing you're just talking about? It's kind of made me start to think right away. Okay, so do you have to now design for when the culture dies because it gets attacked by a virus, or some of the, you know, all of a sudden all these other? Once you do fix the code problem, what is the future design challenge to really? Because maybe the mold wins, right? How do you design for that part? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, we have today we have uh, buildings have huge self-support systems, right? They've got waste removal, heat generation, heat removal, electricity, uh, people who service the buildings and repair it. And I can imagine uh, biological support systems uh, for system, you know, for these systems as well. Um, with the benefit of if you take care of that system, you get something that potentially is self-repairing, uh, self-healing, right? Um, self-reactive to the environment. But I, I do think it opens up a whole other uh, series of questions. Uh, down that vein. I mean, I think there's a tremendous opportunity, this sounds like past tremendous opportunities, uh, for architecture. I mean, this could easily run the, the 
perhaps more predictable route of opening up new territory for biological consulting or environmental consulting on projects as a kind of ongoing uh, process. And I think to the extent that architects want to be involved in that, which I think they should be, that's, that's something that we should you know, really look at. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm just curious. Um, I'm, I'm curious to uh, think a little bit more about risk. Um, I mean, so Blaine, you, you brought up, among other things, this kind of idea that there are geopolitically insecure elements. And I thought that was interesting, because that's actually kind of non-biological, more chemical risk, right, about materials and, you know, what it's made of. You know, and I think, um, you know, Eben, there's building codes all about risk, I guess. Um, and, you know, there's risk of mold, there's risk of structural performance, as you and I have talked about before <laughs> with our collaboration. Um, you know, and I think, Michael Spector, you were also talking about risk in a way. I mean, the 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 numerator denominator thing is is really a question of risk. Um, so I'm curious um, if if you guys or anyone has any um, examples that you think are uh, uh, kind of stories where risk was kind of properly considered, um, addressed, and you know, or arguments about risk that were somehow successful. I mean. And, and maybe there are examples, I, I, I don't know these offhand, but in the, in the switch from like wood to uh, you know, fossil fuels that, that you talked about, Blaine, I mean, I'm not sure if there are stories there about um, you know, people arguing for the benefits of this new technology for burning things um, and maybe not properly understanding some of the risks, but, but I think I'm, I'm just interested if design could could start having risk as part of an intelligent discussion. You know, the way that we try to think we have intelligent discussions about uh, other, other topics related to architecture, but are we properly discussing risks um, or are there good models for that or good examples of that? And that's, a, that's a great question. I think, I think we're already in a better time than we were a decade or two ago with regard to this question. I mean, I can just imagine in an architecture office uh, previously uh, trying to suggest using uh, this kind of mycological insulation in a building at a client meeting and just and just you know having management horrified and uh, so I, I think the fact that it can become part of the conversation is I, I think we should recognize that you know that that there's still a tremendous amount of risk and unknown moving forward. Uh, there's a lot of experimentation happening now, but I think we, we should recognize the fact that the conversation is opened up and that the door is, is open, and that uh, especially young architects and, and students have, a, I think, a perspective that's shaped much more by asking questions, including those that pertain to risk that they might not have previously. Uh, we were just talking about my first materials and methods class, for example, undergrad. It was very, I mean, my perspective at that time was, okay, how are buildings made? Let me just learn that. Uh, and maybe looking at some innovative examples, case studies, but, uh, but now there's, there's the, I think the field is, is pretty, pretty open. Uh, and it allows us to ask the informed questions about, I mean, do we, do we really need to use the entire periodic table? Uh, I mean, life is based on relatively few elements used very wisely over and over in different combinations. Uh, yeah. So, I, but I think, I don't know the full answer to your question, but I think that's yeah. the beginning. I would just comment on, uh, you know, how we evaluate risk in general as society is a really important topic. And um, you heard some examples earlier about this, and like the human brain is really bad at it. Like we're so bad at, at, at like handicapping risk and then making decisions around it. And um, I, I would have two observations. One, I think we should become more risk tolerant in general. Mm. We're safer, healthier, live longer, uh, at less risk than we've ever been in all of time. Uh, whether it's uh, transportation, getting shot, getting stabbed, getting sick, 
not having food, not having shelter, and yet people are more fearful than they've ever been about these things, which, which leads to regulation, which, uh, which leads to constraints. And I think um, we are gonna have a big shift in this, this next epoch materials. And one of the things that will help that shift occur is if we can somehow um, increase the societal tolerance for risk. And, and part of that is cultural, uh, part of that is a media narrative, right? You know, you only see bad things on the news every night, right? So you assume bad things are happening. Um, and part of that is really changing the regulatory process to allow experimentation, whether it's in architecture and design, whether it's in the engineering of organisms, whether it's in the construction of transportation devices. And so I would say that really um, uh, teaching and even teaching like people that you don't understand risk well is an, is an important part of that process. Mm -hmm. And I'll also just add on the elements thing. I think it is really, look at lithium, right? That's, a, mm -hmm. that's you know, the best technology we have for energy storage requires this kind of rare earth mineral. But if you look at a fat, right? The fats that are in your own body, they've got the same energy density as diesel, right? Mm -hmm. Diesel's like the best thing to store energy on, on the planet. So there's a biological analog that's available. If we could figure out how to make a rechargeable bio battery, like suddenly that, that element is, is important but then there may be other trace elements you need for biology. So it's always, the, the balance is always shifting. Yeah, I mean, I, I think those are both uh, really interesting answers. And I just want to add one more thing that um, the, the kind of technology of biology, I think, is interesting here. And, it, you know, it's, I, I think it's not a coincidence that, um, you know, in some ways, all of the talks so far today have dealt with biology and some of the new potential in some way or another. And, you know, I didn't know about your new book, Michael, but it seems fitting, you know, that you're writing about that topic. Um, and some of my own thinking about risk is, I mean, one, that maybe something like climate change and the topic of embodied energy can can make us finally realize that the, like, the default approach, the do-nothing approach, also has risks. Yeah. Right. I mean, so we need to do the calculus, um, you know, the, the numerator and denominator. But also related to biology, um, I've been thinking that, just like you said, Evan, biology is so complex, um, and that is a really, you know, powerful and kind of mesmerizing possibility for us. Um, but it's also possible, I think, that we would have to get familiar with designing without fully understanding. Mm -hmm. you know, and designing yeah. with the kind of black box, a so-called black box. Yeah. And could we get more familiar with that and more comfortable with that? It, it's its own kind of risk, but it's also just like a challenge to our way of thinking. We may never know exactly what those cells are doing inside, but if we can feed it the right inputs and get the desired output, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's a totally new ap ap approach to, to design in a way. I think you almost have to approach biology that way. I mean, the, the, the smallest uh, synthetic organism was just created, right? 500 and something genes, and they still don't know what like 20% of them do, you know? And as an, as an engineer who works with biology, it drives, kind of drives me bonkers, but I think you're right. Like a design approach that says, I don't fully understand this system and I accept it, but if I, if I, if I put A in, I get B out, like with 90% repeatability is, is kind of like gonna be a theme for a while in, in using biology as technology. So I think, these presentations were really unbelievably cool, but it seems to me that when you're <laughs> code violations and in building inspect, you should be thinking more in terms of institutional review boards, I think, like they have. I'm serious, if, yeah. it, it, which is something you do with biological experiments, because when you build something that's alive, there are, as you say, I mean, you say it as a good thing, and I think it's a good thing too, but I think you'll find people on the other side. Complexity is pretty intense. And it, I mean, this is, I think it would be very difficult for a traditional approval matrix to figure out how to say this is a good thing to do for society. I think that the, you're absolutely right. The systems are not, are not even analogous. They're not even compatible with doing something like this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, one, just one point, too, back to David's presentation, is that we've been doing, we've been managing a process like this for, for, you know, before history existed, which was cooking, right, or food, food management, food processing, and I think, I think we can learn a lot from those types of uh, methods and traditions and uh, I mean, obviously, buildings are 
it's a whole other uh, type of sphere. Uh, but I think I think the question's been asked, and and people are starting to be interested. And I think that I mean how we manage risk with food. Uh, you know, cooking, processing, distribution, et cetera, we, we don't always do a great job. And there are E. coli, uh, you know, uh, disasters, et cetera. And so we, we, but we may find that in buildings there's, there's more of that. But it's, I think that's a risk that's worth taking uh, versus the kind of ultra safe, and look where ultra safety got us, so to speak, in, the, in built environments was sick building syndrome, right? We created our own sort of uh, hermetic boxes for disease. Uh, so, I, so I think you're right. I think the, the, the riskiest thing is not to do anything. Uh, my name is John Ellis, I'm a practitioner. What is the future of education like? Should I be taking medical classes as a new student or biology classes? I mean, how do we collaborate across disciplines? With, what does what the product team look like? Talk about that. That's a great question. I think. Part of the future of education has to, I mean, you showed it. <laughs> it's showing kids doing the work. Uh, uh, I think going, going to see your farm and facilities. That, I mean, I think some kind of more immersive hands-on experience is really important. Uh, we're, since you mentioned it, we're starting an interdisciplinary <clears throat> graduate group at the University of Minnesota with biologists, as well as artists. And we're starting to ask some of these questions. Uh, and uh, we're very happy to, to host David next week, who's coming to be a speaker at that, uh, at a symposium called Biologically Motivated. So we're not, we're not really sure yet what that looks like, but we're trying to, to create interdisciplinary um, curricular pathways working directly with biologists, and, we, and we're bringing them into the studio. So right now it's, it's a little hard to measure uh, the outcomes, uh, but I think just, just trying to, uh, craft, tr trying to create a space for that conversation to happen is a good start for us. Yeah. I would say practically you should just be as broadly um, knowledgeable as possible, take as many courses as possible, and um, more specifically, I, I think we should be changing our education system to be teaching people how to think. Um, so often we teach different subjects which all have the same underlying rules. This is true in engineering, this is true in biology, and you just teach them as separate things and you give people all these facts and like some people just naturally derive the fact that the same sets of equations and rules govern these different disciplines and they become like really good at moving things between disciplines. And I think we could just teach people that up front and with the internet, with the access to information, like the importance of teaching facts to people is really, is really less critical in my opinion and I think more time cross-disciplinary, bringing different disciplines together, and really then just explaining like how to solve and think uh, would be valuable. Two quick questions that are sort of related. One, when you have a, I, I think a lot of it goes back to politics and, and education in general. I mean, when you get so many people as climate change deniers, hmm. it's a little scary. Yeah, it's a little scary about, you know, how you deal with that um, because it, it becomes a very political issue as, as we're seeing now particularly. The second question is a little more specific. Do, do you even see um, the, the general trend from uh, prescriptive codes to more performance-based codes as being an optimistic thing, particularly the IBC? I think, I mean, I, I immediately start to think, the political question, immediately start to think about the current political climate, of course, and uh, to the extent that we can create more opportunity for the dif disenfranchised uh, in terms of new modes of production and, and industrial or post-industrial type of growth, uh, and we begin to see some of the reward on the risk that we're taking, I mean, that's obviously, there's a kind of naive side to that and a positive side to that, but I think, I, I think a lot of what we're seeing uh, a lot of the cynicism is based on or related to disenfranchisement and, and feeling like there aren't opportunities. So that would, that's my first thought to respond to that. But you're right, it is, it's very, quite difficult to convince uh, certainly more conservative uh, people when it comes to the built environment and how we do things. Um, I, I would, on the code question, I would say yeah, I think performance-based code is definitely the way to go with targets. And then um, yeah, the political question is a really hard one because it gets to beliefs and 
you know, people believe things and you should let them, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and my, my personal philosophy around that is I, I'm, I would hope that we can have a regulation around carbon and carbon emissions. And I think at the same time, it's the, the, the duty of people who create things, who do, the designers, uh, the inventors, the technologists, to simply create uh, better technologies that will produce those outcomes as best as possible within the current system. So. Um, philosophically, that's where I am on that point. Though I'd love to see everyone uh, embrace that and have regulation. Great. Well, thank you guys very much. That round of applause. For you.